Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dupreuil. Thank you very much, Bert. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to send you today and to give that lecture. You always expect that who's coming in now, more than 100 papers published, so he must be a, much, look, look much older than he is, and, uh, or looks at least. <laughs> but I, uh, I would try to, to give a bit of uh, some insights about the, the research we're doing in Delft, and uh, we actually hardly do it in Delft, we basically do it somewhere else, so therefore I'm also very pleased to send here at the set at the uh, Center for Addictive Social, uh, which, which has a, a great name, also together with the Bonn University and the different institutions that I work in the field of water and environment. So it's really for me to, it's a pleasure to, to come here. And I immediately said yes when I was asked to, to come, but uh, finding a date was, was a bit more difficult. I, I will talk about today uh, the role of hydrological process research in, in a global development context, and uh, will, will emphasis, it will give emphasis in particular to, to the global class. This is the entrance of the institute where I'm working, and uh, I hold another position there. I'm also an active vice director of academic affairs, and uh, therefore, of course, I have a small commercial break here. In the first couple of slides, I would briefly like to introduce also the institute for um, what I'm working, and then I think there are some similarities also to itself. We, we have about 170 staff members. Oh, yeah, pointer. Is that a pointer? No. Ah, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, 100, you know? <laughs> 100 and staff members, we have some good facilities and a very multicultural atmosphere. So it's a bit the same picture as, as I observe here in, in uh, Bonn. Uh, we hardly have any students from, from, from Europe. More than 90% come from, from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. We carry out a couple of master programs and we do that ourselves. So we don't do that together with Technical University of Delft, because it's an accredited institute. It's, it's almost 60 years old by now. And uh, we do different water related master programs, that's some 180, 200 uh, master students per year. And we, we also do joint double degree programs with, with different partners in, in Europe and uh, the Global South. Then we do many short course participants, and also we have 130 PhD students. So it's also quite a critical mass of PhD students, but we do together then also with many partners in the Netherlands and abroad. And of course, we publish some papers and postdocs and, and, and the usual. Um, the, the, um, the, the most interesting is that it's only a water institute. And the most interesting part of it is that, that we do have people coming from, from the, all the relevant disciplines. So we have people coming from natural science background, maybe like myself, uh, earth science, life sciences, physics, mathematics, and so, but also engineering and technology. We have many engineering uh, faculty, civil engineering, agricultural engineering, etc., etc., but also social sciences, and that's a field which we really want to strengthen also in the coming years. And uh, we have 20, 30 percent of the staff members have a social science background, and also that we see as a very important component for water environment, and we want to strengthen that further. So the interesting part is that you have people from, from the different disciplines uh, working all on water subject. I know you have many more social scientists and engineers and, and natural scientists at the University of Bonn, but we have, and they're in, in one incident, they all work on water, and that's the interesting aspect of it. Uh, here's a regional distribution from our students from uh, uh, some years back, but it's basically the same. It's 30, 40 percent from Africa, uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 percent from Asia, varies a little bit from year to year, and then from Latin America and the Middle East. Um, others means North America and Eastern Europe. So we have any students from, from, from Western Europe, but more from the uh, East or Southeast of Europe. Uh, this is our map of the alumni, and you see the, the size of the different dots indicates already where our geographical focus is, and uh, that's in particular Africa and Asia. And due to funding, it, it varies a little bit, of course, at the moment, Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular ladies from Sub-Saharan Africa, get, get a, a high priority in the international funding and donor regulations, and therefore we have more students from that uh, region. So we hardly have any students who can pay that for themselves. They basically depend on uh, fellowships, and it's a bit similar, I guess, at Seth. And, and therefore the geographical focus also comes with donor policies. We are proud to say that, that we, and we just finished another alumni survey, uh, that most of them, the very most of them, actually go back and they still keep on working in the water sector. And that's very important. So we do not want to contribute to the brain drain. We really want to educate them, bring them back, bring them hopefully in key positions and uh, do good things for water and environment. And at the moment there are four ministers uh, from IG in charge in different countries and uh, there's quite a number of other kind of people holding quite senior positions. Uh, and, and we are proud of that, and we use them also as an alumni network to, to bring our next uh, generation of water people also in the leadership position and then try to, 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 to have the, the good aspects of, of this networking also to, to really uh, 
push them forward and uh, sometimes more, sometimes less successful. But they all return and they, they are still active in the water sector quite some years after graduation. That, there, was a, there was a commercial break on UNESCO IG, so if you, if you find it too much of a commercial break, I apologize for that. But uh, on the other hand, I found it also interesting to say that because to introduce that institute to you and, and to give you, uh, in, you know, some background of uh, where the speaker of tonight is basically coming from. Now I want to speak a little bit about global changes. Well, uh, talking about global changes in Bonn is, is, a, is a bit bizarre, you know. <laughs> we are looking to Bonn to learn about the latest uh, research on, on global change impacts also in the field of uh, water, where, where I'm busy with. But uh, so, so my, some of my slides might be very repetitive for you, and I, again, I apologize for that. But on the other hand, I want to put my emphasis to put the, the hydrologic process research component into it, and, uh, and maybe we can uh, uh, continue with that then in the discussion. Well, it's getting warmer, we all know that, and we know how, how large the uncertainty is, and we know about the awareness for global warming is, is, is tremendous. Also, the, the, we can measure that since quite a couple of decades. Huh? These are measurements, these are not uh, these uncertain uh, model predictions where we not really know how, how much warmer it will get, but we, we know it, it's, it's getting warmer. But, but how exactly and how that varies in space and time, we do not know. Well, and then the, the Kilimanjaro is then the, the, uh, the, the favorite picture, uh, which uh, Al Gore always shows in his movie and in his lectures, and, and then the Global Key Peace Prize also helped a lot. To, to, to raise a lot of awareness about global warming and uh, global, uh, climate change. So if you talk to any Af uh, farmer in Africa, they all know about it's getting warmer and climate change. Huh? That, that's usually the first thing that comes if, if, you, if you speak with uh, many locals uh, all over the world. So I was amazed by that. But, but I think you also agree with me that it's maybe the temperature <laughs> increase. If it's two, three, four, or five degrees more, that probably doesn't matter too much. No? It's more about the change in the energy system. It's more about the change of the precipitation pattern. It's more about the, the change of extremes in the field of hydrology that, that probably matter much, much more than, than just the, the average warming, yeah, which is uncertain anyway and, and probably doesn't say too much. If you then look at, at some global predictions, and this, this is now directly copy and pasted from the uh, 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 Nobel Peace Prize document, the IPCC report from 2007, and you want to expect it in a few months, I think. And uh, uh, what we see here, you see that according to an, an, uh, an average out of the 12 best climate models, what we have here, um, that some regions get wetter, uh, they, 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 uh, they likely generate more runoff, other, other areas get drier, usually the Mediterranean area, for instance, or the yeah, uh, southwestern US and Mexico and so on. But, but what does that say? You know, and, and this is the, 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 the quite a robust estimate from the best 12 climate models we have, and that's the mean annual runoff for, for some 20 years in the future according to one of the scenarios. But of course you show a different scenario, you look at each of the 12 climate models separately, and they all have a different pattern, of course. Yeah? But is the annual mean runoff over 20 years, is that really an interesting parameter? I don't think so. Well, if you look, this is a, a, a hydrograph in, uh, measured in Jordan. Uh, is, this is ours. You see here, the, the discharge increases for maybe two, three hours, and goes up to a peak discharge. Before it was zero, then you have a falling limb, and, and then uh, it's, it's nothing again, maybe for the next year. Now that, that's how a hydrograph looks like. So the, the 20 years average for that is, it doesn't tell us very much. It's all about the dynamics, about the peak runoff, about the total volume, about the 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 uh, um, the, the oops, the, the riding lid and the falling lid and how many, how much water of that infiltrates and actually become groundwater reacher. These are much more interesting parameters than just the average over 20 years, which is a completely misleading and, and not very useful picture. And then also if you look at this picture, well, it's a Hara Desert, maybe an uh, increase of 40% discharge, meaning you deserve, well, you know, 40% increase of nothing is, is still very, very little. So it also, again, doesn't tell us too much. So it's all about trying to interpret that and, and downscale that to, to local scale and, and be able to, to predict something uh, according to water resources. Um, it's probably an, another main driver to changes is, is the, uh, the demographics, huh? the, the population increase, and it doesn't matter if you look on the left hand side on the relative growth or the absolute growth. And uh, both are positive except in Europe, so we are actually uh, uh, decreasing, if that is true here, that number huh? since, uh, since already some years and it's likely to decrease further. But in particular the green line is quite striking, that keeps on being positive and uh, also in absolute growth, at least for the next decades, uh, population is uh, increasing. But it's not so much if we probably have 10 billion people on this planet in a, in a couple of years from now. It's more about um, 
where do they live, how do they deal with the resources, what is the age distribution of these people, and uh, uh, what do they eat, also to some extent. Uh, here you see another picture um, uh, which shows the relative increase of people in urban areas. I show the urban areas because of this picture from La Paz, maybe some of you have been there, and, and not all these neighborhoods are, are properly designed and, and, and well maintained by, by well-educated trained uh, graduates here from Saffron University of Bonn. No, 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 they're something just, you know, people just settle somewhere and uh, uh, deal with the resources as good as they can. And what you see here in this picture is that uh, it's, it's getting more urban, yeah, probably from 50 to some 60 percent in, in uh, 20 years. Yeah, we, we know that. And interesting is that in Europe and Latin America, it's already a very urbanized society, huh? and that the relative increase is small compared to Africa and Asia. Here you have the much larger relative increases in urban population, and the, the, the growth in, in the demographics is, input, is directly correlated to people living in peri-urban areas in, in, in large cities in Africa. At least. So that, that's, these are the challenges, and that's what we have to deal with. Will there be enough water for everybody? I'm still in the general global change introduction. And, uh, well, nothing new. I'm talking about this institute, and I'm very pleased to see that land use is here quite, quite, quite prominent on the, on the research themes of uh, Seth. And, and, and we know that, that uh, growing enough food and uh, having enough land resources directly depends also on the water resources. And uh, you see here maybe a, a data set which you have seen before. You see here the, the meat consumption. In, uh, in different parts of the world. And if you look at that globally, in the last um, 50 years or so, it probably doubled huh? from, from 20 to some 50 or 40 or so. Uh, USA, it seems to be stabilizing their, their meat consumption, if, if you believe in these projections. However, places like China, so it's really enormous, you know, maybe we have a Chinese uh, a colleague here in the audience, and uh, it, 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 it is amazing. So it's, it's, it's tenfold uh, the, the amount of meat that is consumed in China nowadays than, than it was uh, previously. Therefore, food sufficiency is, is a big, big um, issue, but it's also water resources. So China needs to import a lot of fodder nowadays to just be able to feed all the animals or, or, or import the, the meat directly to, to be able to uh, uh, enable food security. And uh, then the, 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 the link between food and water is always how much water is needed to produce so many kilocalories uh, uh, kilo uh, of uh, food. And then the, the, the questions that I usually ask in my, my introduction lecture to first year students is then, uh, so what do you think, how much water do you need for, for uh, a kilogram of beef? Anybody knows? I know some know, but <laughs> what is that? What order of magnitude are we talking about? How many liters of water do we need to produce one kilogram of beef? Think. Professors have to uh, be silent for a moment because <laughs> they know. <laughs> Nobody dares to uh, make an estimate yet. 4,000 meters. 4,000? Yeah, 4, yeah who, who gives more? <laughs> <laughs> well, it varies a lot where, where, where like, the cattle or where the pasture land is, but, but there's some estimates going up to 20,000 liters of water for one kilogram of beef. Yeah. If you eat chicken, then you, yeah, then you, your the backpack of water, <coughs> a kilogram of chicken. If you eat a whole kilogram, is is low. And then we talk about seven thousand liters of water for one kilogram of chicken. Yeah. A t-shirt is is two, three, four thousand, depending on the quality of the t-shirt and where the cotton is grown. So it's an enormous amount of water that we need for our consumption. Yeah. And not the, not only the little two liters of water we drink. It's it's the it's the backpack of water that is attached to the food and the other consumables that we, that we consume. Yeah. A cup of coffee I heard, but I, I don't believe that. It's 100 liters of water. But I, I hate to believe it because I'm very addicted to coffee. So I, um, uh, and it, it probably depends on how you produce that coffee. And point I want to make, uh, if we expect some 10 billion people on this planet in, in two generations, probably less in 2050, uh, uh, we, we probably need to double the food production. Not because there are twice as many people, it's more because of the consumption pattern, the diets are changing. And it's also the needs for water and agriculture need to double. Now, so we need to, to somehow generate twice the water resources, but that's very difficult in many places of the world, as you know, where we have very tense water resource situation already. So something needs to change. So we cannot con uh, continue with the same technology and with the same approaches to food production and consumption as we do at this very moment. 
Therefore, agricultural expansion, this is a picture from uh, Rwanda, where we do some research, and Rwanda is the country of the thousand hills, I think it's called, and almost uh, in these hills, between the hills, you have beautiful wetlands, or used to have beautiful wetlands. Nowadays, almost all the, the valley floors, all these wetlands, are developed for, for agricultural production. Huh? This is uh, rice fields and, and other agricultural production, and it's actually done by, by prisoners, all these white uh, gentlemen. Are, there's a local prison, and they force them to work on the uh, fields to develop the wetlands and uh, <coughs> food security. But all the wetlands are are, are developed nowadays, or are getting intensively developed, and that of course has some impact on ecosystem services of these wetlands, which are very relevant for the ecosystems in that region. Then we, we, we create a lot of dams, and then in particular, if you travel to Africa, you find many people busy with that business at the moment. Also, many Chinese colleagues are busy there with this hard, hardcore hydraulic work. And uh, we, we do that a lot for irrigation uh, uh, demand, and but also involving multi-purpose dams with uh, that are used for flood defense and uh, and other other issues as well. And you see that we are, the hydrological regimes are changed to quite extent. I will talk about hydrological regimes in, in, in my case study a bit later. Uh, and one one aspect which which I always like to mention, I, I'm, I'm uh, quite involved in, in the project in the Mekong. The Mekong is in Southeast Asia, that is chaired to be China, Laos, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam. And uh, it, it receives a lot of attention. The Mekong is probably one of the river basins, this is the well, most investigated river basin for, for uh, environmental researchers, which, which is very good. It's very interesting, it's a transboundary basin, there's some, some, some fighting about the water, so it's a very interesting research area to study. We received the project, and I know also colleagues here in Bonn, and that, uh, the Wisdom Project, and I'm not sure who's involved, but, but maybe some of you in the audience are involved in that. They do a lot of work on the climate change impact in the Delta region, which is very, very important research. We also have a postdoc program with eight postdocs all working on the Mekong, very nice. We got this money, um, and I'm directing that project with 700,000 euros, so it's, it's, it's serious money. 700,000 euros for a two-year project is uh, significant. And, and we got it because we said about climate change adaptation, and that, that's a kind of a card to play, and then, then you, you, it's, 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 it's a good, good, good thing to do some research. And, and I agree, it's also very important for the people. But if you look at the climate change uh, uh, impacts, which were predicted by, by some, some colleagues from uh, Finland and uh, Australia, you see that the precipitation is likely to change gradually, maybe one, two, maybe three percent annual precipitation. And I know it's not only the annual precipitation that matters. If you look at the sea level changes, it's also increasing maybe 20, 30 centimeters in the next 20, 40 years, which is, which is tough, yeah? but it's quite gradual, yeah? and you, you, you have some chance to adapt. On the other hand, you see a lower graph. This is the development of, of dams in the region, huh? and they, they, they do eightfold the, the storage capacity already in the next five years. Yeah? So the, 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 development of reservoirs is much more rapid and probably much more impacting water resources and, and, and nutrient projects in this Mekong River Basin than climate change itself. So, so actually, uh, so, so put climate change context, uh, research into context, that's maybe my main, main message here at this figure. Then, of course, uh, to, to secure the food, uh, um, food security, uh, we have what we observe in, in particular in Africa at the moment, a lot of so-called land grabbing um, that, that Western uh, countries or also Chinese and other uh, economies are investing in Africa at this very moment to uh, take over land resources to uh, produce food. And uh, there's also the discussion of so-called climate colonialism. And you see here some uh, uh, activities uh, mapped out for Africa and some countries and they talk about the African land rush. Also, our country here, our home country, is also active in Ethiopia in this field. Um, with impacts for uh, land use changes, of course, uh, then we have here um, deforestation. I think it's nothing new that the uh, change of forest cover is changing the hydrological dynamics quite dramatically. But also the opposite. I'm involved in some research in southern Africa where we look at reforestation. And, and these eucalyptus trees that you see on this picture, they are very thirsty trees. Huh? These eucalyptus trees, they try to take up all the water they find in the soil and groundwater. And this has huge impacts on the low flow dynamics and the uh, <coughs> water resources in general. So also the opposite is very important to investigate. 
One, one field of research where, where I did uh, some work on is the impact of biofuel. Uh, some four or five years ago, there were very ambitious plans to upscale biofuel production uh, dramatically in the coming years. Yeah. Also, the, the German government and other European government, uh, not European government, the EU, European Union, had quite ambitious plan of blending in a significant amounts of methanol, uh, ethanol, ethanol into our uh, in, into the gasoline, which is, which, which is uh, probably good. Uh, you see on this, we uh, good for some reasons, but um, what you see here is a, a landscape in India, um, in a, in a semi-arid part of India. I took that picture from a from a publication, and what what they did here is uh, your trophy uh, recultivation. They, uh, they did a big monoculture of Yatropha. Yatropha is one of the plants that, that became very popular uh, when, when the biofuel discussion started. Biofuel was, became so popular that even George W. Bush at the time, who was not really a typical Green Party politician, huh? <laughs> but even he was very supportive of, the, uh, of, uh, of, of ethanol production and biofuel. But it, it's not that that TV immediately became greener, so there were many other considerations for, for the Bush administration to to uh, strengthen uh, uh, the uh, biofuel production. What you can what can you think of? Why why was the Bush administration at the time very interested to to boost uh, biofuel production? The, 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 the refineries were mushrooming ruining all over the the, the Midwest and the US. And it was the support of the local farmers was a very interesting argument, but another one, which was maybe not said so clearly, at least not officially, was to become more independent from some you know, uncertain uh, countries, uh, or politically a bit, a bit difficult countries in the Middle East. You know, they, they saw a chance of boosting that, and on the other hand, to become uh, geopolitically more independent from, from some countries in the Middle East. Yeah. That was one of the many other arguments. Um, and you, you can, uh, well, you probably uh, can uh, read some Dutch by now. Yeah, the Biobrandstoff is, uh, I think the German uh, speakers at least can, can, can understand that. You, you can discuss is that moral? If, if we use uh, a biofuel, it, it, which, which could also be used as food for, for people in the South, is it immoral? And uh, therefore, the, the, the enthusiasm also came in for plants like Yatropha. Yatropha is a, is a pharmaceutical plant. It's not, you cannot eat it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's poisonous even. Yeah? And uh, it, it offers new opportunity as a so-called second generation biofuel plant. And it has its role to play. Here again, a few uh, figures that the importance of biomass for the global energy mix will increase significantly. These are two pictures, one from Shell, another a company which is not having a high stake in, in pushing biofuel. No? Uh, but also, uh, um, IASA is doing some research and they all expect that biomass, in as, as much as solar, will play a key role in the future energy mix. So coming back to my uh, Yatropa example, is, is the following. Uh, now, now we look at this picture for a moment with our hydrological glasses. So put on your hydrological glasses and not only think about how that change in the land cover changes the, the, the ecology or uh, people's job opportunity, also like what, what would that mean hydrologically? And uh, you probably all agree that the evaporation from the interception flux is much larger in this type of landscape that in this area, huh? you have more canopy cover, and of course more water can sit on the leaves and can evaporate that. So that, that's an easy one, that the, the evaporation on interception is probably much larger. The transpiration is probably also much larger on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. The right-hand side, you hardly have any vegetation, therefore less, much less transpiration than on the left picture. While the soil evaporation, that's the evaporation directly from the soil, is probably much larger in this area than in the other one. Yeah. So you see that all the evaporation fluxes already change through the land cover. Yeah. We can continue like this. The soil storage is maybe larger on the right, uh, excuse me, on the left hand side because you have more roots, fine roots in the, in the soil, and, and there's more storage capacity in the left, in the, in the uh, recultivated area than in the right area. Maybe the groundwater recharge is larger in this area than in this type of area. It's the same landscape, only three years later. Huh? Uh, maybe it was much larger before the groundwater recharge than there, because here much more water is used. Excuse me, here much more water is used for evaporation back to the atmosphere than there. And if, if the soil physical conditions allow groundwater recharge, then probably is more recharge happening here than on the right hand side. So again, all the dynamics are changing. Exactly, I don't know. Maybe it's also the other way around. Depends on the local soil physical conditions. Maybe the surface runoff. If this is work. 
on with uh, heavy machinery, then uh, probably the topsoil is very compacted and you have more surface runoff generation than in this area, at least if you have sandy soils that, that suggest also uh, infiltration. Again, it could also be the other way around, and depending on the, the, the specific local uh, land management techniques. Though it could well be that the overall discharge, if we include the groundwater recharge, uh, the overall discharge out of, out of this landscape is much larger than in this area. Huh? So for downstream water users, the upstream development of your trophar could, could well be uh, less positive than people try to look at it. Um, finally, if we do that at big scale, so not, not, not a few hectares of your trophar somewhere, but if you really change the, the, the forest cover or large scale the land use, then we even change the precipitation. Yeah? So the Amazon, of course, has a different precipitation pattern if, if you have soybeans or, or humid tropical forest. Yeah, because of the transpiration, uh, the in particular transpiration flux back to the atmosphere, and then the, the local convection and convective systems that you have in, in humid tropical regions. But in semi-arid regions, it's the same. So if you if you change the land use at big scale, you also change the rainfall pattern. Yeah. But more interesting is also that you not only change the rainfall pattern in your own area, you might even change the rainfall pattern somewhere else. My favorite example is, is Ethiopia, for instance. You, you uh, maybe some know, know the, uh, uh, as you all know the country, and you know the importance of Ethiopia for the Nile. Huh? More than 80% of the runoff in flowing in the river Nile comes from the Ethiopian highlands. Yeah? All that rainfall falling to the Ethiopian highlands finally becomes runoff, gets into the Blue Nile mainly, some in the Abara and the southern one, and then flow in the river Nile. 300 million people roughly depend on the water resources of the Nile. And how much water is in the Nile is really a, that, that's an issue of peace in that region, yeah? and therefore there's a lot of tension also with the current attempt of the Ethiopians to, to uh, use the uh, hydropower at the Blue Nile. It's also very important what the Ethiopians are doing to the Nile, to, uh, to the to the land in terms of uh, managing their water resources, because the Egyptians at the receiving end. They, they have a high stake in whatever the Ethiopians are doing to their water because more than 80% of the Nile discharge comes from the Ethiopian highlands. So they have a high stake in what the Ethiopians are doing and they also use that power to some extent in the Nile Basin region. Yeah, and not only to some extent, to, to a certain extent. Uh, now you could argue, well, that Ethiopian and, uh, Ethiopia and Egypt relation is very clear. It's an upstream-downstream relation. It's the same for the living on the Netherlands. It's the same for Germany and the Swiss doing to the Rhine. It's very important for us in the Netherlands, you know, otherwise we get flooded all the time. So, so there must be very good agreements, and in these countries it's also, uh, I think, quite, quite solved in a very interesting, in a positive way. Now, coming back to Ethiopia and the Nile, uh, some, most of the moisture flux of that rainfall falling on the Ethiopian highlands, generating the Nile discharge, comes from the Indian Ocean. Yeah, most of it. But some also comes from the Congo Basin. There's a, a, a small flux from evaporation from the Congo area, flowing, uh, redistributing through the atmospheric circulation patterns, redistributing that moisture to, to Ethiopia. So the, the Egyptians actually also have a stake what in the Congo Basin is happening. Because if, if, if the DRC would decide, oh, we change that forest cover, we use that forest by now, and uh, let's see what happens, that, that would change the moisture flux. And that would not only change the hydrology in the Congo completely, it would, might also to some extent change the moisture flux to Ethiopia, and then the whole uh, water distribution in the Nile. So you see also the, through the atmospheric uh, circulation how everything is connected. Yeah. Therefore, my argument is always people say, oh, now we do integrated water resources management. We look at the catchment and the whole catchment say, oh, that's very good. But you should also look at the catchment of, of the neighbors, yeah? where the water is coming from. Yeah? Maybe one last example for, for, uh, uh, for China. You know the big rivers in China, the Yangtze, the Yellow River, also the Mekong, they all originate from the, the western part of China and flow to the east, or southeast the Mekong. And now you, you argue, you think, where, where is that rainfall actually coming from, from these, from these areas? Huh? To some extent it comes from the Pacific, but to very significant part it comes from continental evaporation. Yeah? And the continental evaporation because of the West Wind drift comes from where? From, even from Europe or what we call Russia or the new independent states. So if the land use is changed in this part, the rainfall in China will be changed, and that, that really causes significant impacts on the Chinese water resources. Yeah. So you see how everything is connected. So even we in Germany with our forests, 
we have an, we have an impact on Chinese water resources. Of course, a small one, I agree. <laughs> but at least you see how everything is connected and uh, how um, how we need to understand these fluxes. I try to do that in a very simplified way with these errors, uh, just to make the point how everything is connected on a, on a global and continental scale. Um, so you see, this is the water balance equation. I'm sure Professor Dieckrüger is explaining the same uh, when, when he teaches introduction to hydrology and water resources in, uh, here in Bonn University. And uh, I don't want to go into it. That's a simple form, and then we can uh, make it a bit more interesting. And if we separate the distant evaporation fluxes and the storage changes, the DSTTs, and these different discharge fluxes, my point I want to make is that changes in all these parameters are possible when you change the land use. So it's not that simple, oh, we deforest or we reforest and then we a bit more evaporation or evapotranspiration. No, it's much more complicated because each of these terms are highly nonlinear and, uh, and depend on each other. And there are many nonlinear interactions between the different parameters. And that makes it very difficult for us hydrologists also to predict the impact of change. What happens to a change is a picture from Bolivia. If we change the land use there, what is happening here in the development? I hope you can see this a little bit on this picture. I don't know. And the same in your metropolitan areas. Another picture from Latin America. Uh, also, uh, subject of further research. Water quality is another impact. I don't want to go into this. This is Lake Victoria, Kizumu Bay, where um, the high phosphorus input into Lake Victoria, and in particular to Kizumu Bay here. This is Kizumu, the largest city in, in Kenya, side of Lake Victoria. Uh, the, the fishermen were not able to leave with their boats for several months because of this mass of, of uh, organic material <laughs> that they were not able to, to allow any navigation on the, on the lake for several weeks, and that, that's very, very, very serious. Um, so, my, I conclude my, my global change part, uh, that everything is changing. Climate change is usually the first thing that comes, but it's, it's much more the population change, the land cover changes, the change in hydraulic works, the change in the diet, etc., etc., what causes impact for water resources. Um, now I want to, would like to show one little case study. I have two more parts, but they are, they are shorter. Uh, first, I would like to show one little case study, which we recently published in uh, HESS. Um, and it's about, uh, it's about the, the human impacts on, on catchment scale. We, we study here, I hope you can see that this is China. This is the Yellow River, where this Yellow River makes this, this interesting turn here. And there in the middle of this uh, Les Plateau, you have um, uh, uh, the Budin catchment, and we study the Hayito catchment, which is the sub-catchment of the Budin uh, River Basin. It's an important river basin, semi-arid, cold semi-arid. Uh, um, very interesting, show some pictures in a, in a minute. And the main study part, what I present today, is about detecting the impact of the flow regime on annual, monthly, and daily scale, but also to look why is that changing? Is it the climate? Is it the water resources development? Or is it the land use? Yeah. What actually is responsible for the change that we can observe? Uh, we, we recently published that. If you, uh, you can find a paper on HESS, so it's an open access journal. Just download it. Um, the, the, the climate, briefly, in, the, in this area is uh, cold, semi-arid, uh, summer rainfall dominated. You see here in July, August is most of the rainfall, but also the temperature is the highest. Uh, pan evaporation amounts to some 2,000 millimeters per year. Total rain, uh, excuse me, precipitation in that area is in the order of uh, 250, 300 millimeters per year, but mainly in the summer region. All agriculture needs uh, at least supplementary irrigation, so purely rainfall is not possible, so we always talk about irrigation when we talk about agriculture in that field. Here you see uh, us working, well you see me taking the pictures and the others do all the hard work, you know, that, that's the advantage of professors, they travel and come for one week and, and the others uh, really have to suffer and do all this. And what, we, what we do there is uh, we study uh, transpiration fluxes at different tree species and, uh, and salics, um, the bushes. Then we study meteorology, hydrology, soil, soil water uptake, and we also looked at isotopic composition of soil water and groundwater, and we're studying when which trees take from which water resources. So when do they depend on groundwater, when do they depend on soil water, how is that changing during the seasons, and what does that mean for, for reforestation efforts? The Chinese do quite some 
to, 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 to fight the desertification. They did quite some reforestation efforts there, which is, which is maybe interesting or very good for many reasons. But we were studying what does that mean for the trees, where do they take the water from, and uh, uh, which species are uh, acting out. Uh, well, I, I will not, uh, uh, you have to invite me again in a few years. We have two, three papers in review at the moment on this. Also, in the isotope work we are doing, but I will not speak about that today. I would like to speak about the changes in the runoff regimes. Now we look now at catchment scale instead of a plot scale, and we observed quite some interesting changes. You always have the same time scale here. This is the 50s and the 60s. Then we had higher discharge. It's the mean annual runoff. I apologize for this small, small legend here. Uh, we have a larger annual discharge, also much more variability, much more changes. Also, the standard deviation of monthly discharge is much higher. That's before. Uh, water resources were developed before reservoirs were built, before um, big agricultural development happened, or big at least developed. Yeah. You see then it's going down over the years. We found with statistical analysis several phases where the discharge were reduced or the variability was reduced. And, uh, and we found one time in the 90s where it was actually the lowest. Yeah? I come to the reasons in a minute. In a minute. Discharge was the lowest, variability was the lowest, annual peaks were the lowest, etc. We also did uh, some, some statistical text, pet, petty test and, and change point analysis and all these uh, tricks, all is written up in the paper, I don't want to go into detail. And we found that before the late 60s was maybe the natural regime in terms of variability, and then there were several other phases where we found several change points in the 80s and the 90s, 2001 is an important one, where also a number of different runoff parameters changed. I, I skipped the statistical details. Yeah, also we did some, some harmonic uh, analysis, time series analysis. I skipped the details as well. Also, you see the flow duration curves, and you see quite different flow duration curves in these different years. So the runoff regime changed. It was very variable, much more water, then it became less, and uh, became very low, then it became more again. Why? And why did that flow regime change? Is it just the natural variability of the climate? That's the first, what you change, what you check. This is the precipitation. Uh, we, we, we invested quite a number of different precipitation parameters. It's all in the paper, and we didn't find any change. So it's not the change in the rainfall pattern. Yeah? Then we looked at temperature, yes, and it's getting a little bit warmer in the last years. Well, that's, that's not unfamiliar to us. We talked about global warming. It's getting warmer. We also observed that there. But not, it didn't change in the 60s and the 70s so much in that region, at least, at least the data we got after, I don't know how much, searching for it. And so the, 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 the meteorological pattern is not responsible for these changes. Interesting is that the crop area changed quite interestingly. Well, we only got aggregated data on uh, uh, Kind of uh, municipality level, not 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 detailed data for every field, but but at least there were quite some interesting, uh, significant change points in the in the crop pattern. You see this here, which coincide with the change in the discharge. So the suspicious thing is now, oh, probably the land cover changes are responsible for the discharge changes. Um, interesting is now if we then look also at the Chinese. Policies, huh? and China is a beautiful country where they do a policy, they really do it. It's not like here in Europe where we first discussed, I don't know, for how many years, and then, uh, find a compromise and maybe do it differently again because the government is in space. But, but in, in China, it can be quite, quite drastic, yeah? and, and that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, you, you see here the changes, and then the, the change of the policy to uh, cultivate terraces uh, had. Was, was issues in the, in the 70s, and interestingly, at the same time, we found also a change in the crop pattern, which actually went down, more terraces were built, but also the annual water resources then uh, were, went down, and which is maybe also coinciding with the, some smaller reservoirs that were developed in this region. Interesting is also that there was a policy on uh, irrigation development, though the, the crop area significantly <coughs> went up in that area, and that really coincides with the lowest annual water resource and other hydrological parameters that we were investigating. Again, this cannot be explained by climate change. It can probably be explained with the change in the crop pattern. And then in 1999, the, there was a policy to return farmland to forest. And, and you see, you know, that, that's what I mean, you know, China's an interesting country, because then you see immediately how much it dropped then within years. Yeah? And, uh, and that you would not observe so drastically in, in Europe. Therefore, you again see these patterns here as well. So let me conclude this study. 
Um, what are the reasons for the flow regime shifts in the, in the semi-arid catchment? We first that detected four major flow regimes. They can mainly be explained by the impact of land use policies in China and not by climate change, climate variability, and uh, has probably large impact on groundwater dependent ecosystems. That's what we are studying at this very moment where we instrumented different trees and bushes and uh, looked at isotope composition of the water, etc. Okay, I have now the last part of my, my lecture. Is, is that okay if I speak for another uh, 10 minutes or so, Max? And then I, I conclude it. Um, I, I would like to speak, as uh, you know, I, I said before, I'm acting vice director of academic affairs, so I have to look after the education programs uh, at, at IG, also what we do jointly with, with many partners around the world. Uh, I, I, I develop quite some interest in, in that how do we educate actually the next generation of people, who, what do they need to know and, and what, what maybe we should give them as, as a baggage, as skills and competencies. Um, and if, if you look at, at the, the, the challenges in hydrology, they may be not so different if your own interest is mainly on, on land use or on soils or I, I don't know. Uh, you see quite a number of buzzwords uh, coming uh, that, that we have to think about coupled system, nature, human nature systems, that we have to think about cradle to cradle uh, approaches, that we kind of think in, in cycles. Well, the, we, we, the Green Party in Germany talks about this in the 80s, so it's nothing new, but, but now, um, it, it's the general policy that we think in cycles, that we think about how to reuse energy, how to reuse uh, nutrients, how to reuse water resources, etc. And we think that uh, basically what, what it means for water education is a system thinking, that people understand hydrological systems in the relation to other systems and how systems interact. I talk about human systems, agricultural systems, ecosystems, etc. And how do they add, add to each other and how do they compose a completely integrated, holistic way. Because we also think that, that real solutions can only be developed not only by a technological approach, but also through a holistic approach when you try to understand the whole system and how the different components of the system add to each other and how they interact. Therefore, this system thinking is a key component for our educational approach. Um, further, our, our education, and I talk about master, uh, programs, Master of Science programs we have. We don't have MA, so we only do Master of Science. Then we have a PhD program, some 130 PhD students and some postdocs, uh, more project-based. Uh, we all would like them to, to follow a T-shape profile. What is a T-shape? A T is what you see here. It has a vertical, bo uh, vertical leg and a horizontal bar. The vertical leg stands for the, the, uh, the disciplinary understanding, the cognitive understanding of your chosen discipline. Maybe you, you study, you're interested to become a hydrologist here or a physical geographer or whatever at Bonn University. So the, the, your, uh, your, you, you, you selected that, you want to specialize in geomorphology, it doesn't matter which subject, but that's the understanding of geomorphology, what you need. Now that's the, the vertical leg. But to become really useful later in the job market, you also need the horizontal part. This is a basic understanding of other disciplines. Like that a hydrologist, a hydraulic engineer, for instance, a really hardcore engineer, also understands basics of ecology, basics of human geography. Um, also has other skills and competencies like uh, professional skills, report writing, personal skills, uh, being organized, being able to present something in an efficient way, etc., etc. That's the horizontal part. And we try to, to bring that into our education through all the system. Now you maybe have some students who have maybe a strong vertical left, so they're very interested in their discipline, they want to go deep in their discipline and they're not so interested in the horizontal part. Others are maybe more generalists, they, they, they want to not to go too deep in hydraulic engineering because all these differential equations, no, no. They, they, but, they, but they want to have a bit more wider, wider <laughs> we try to, to, to accommodate that through so offering selective courses that they say, well, I, I can specialize in this and this and that at the same time, but everybody should have a vertical leg, because the opposite maybe is this one. <laughs> that's a generalist who knows a lot of things a little bit. Yeah, that's what we don't want to educate. We don't, our objective is not to train generalists. Huh? Some of the integrated water resources management programs are producing generalists, we feel. Yeah? They're not really specialized in hydrology or hydraulic engineering or uh, the social science component of water management. They know everything a little bit, but not, not the most useful in a, in a job position, we feel. Yeah? Uh, you can challenge me on that in the discussion. 
uh, and the classical university profile is the DI shape program who knows everything about their own discipline but nothing else. Yeah. That we also don't think is the most useful uh, graduate uh, who really makes a difference uh, later to, to do these integrated systems thinking I was talking about. Um, why is that so good? Here you see uh, I shaped professionals working in a team. Maybe they have to work on, on, a, on a flood management issue, and you, you have maybe a hydrologist here. That's uh, where's my mouse here? This is the hydrologist with eye shape education, and he's a bit close to the early warning expert because they partly have the same education, they can talk the same language, and, and, and they can collaborate quite nice. Maybe you need another land use or a spatial planner who, who knows a lot about land use and spatial planning in that team to really solve the flood management in that region. But they, he's a bit, or she, is a bit further away and the, the, the talking is more difficult to each other huh? because they don't share the, the same disciplinary background. If you go to urban planning, maybe that's even further away, or, or policy and governance, and maybe there's a social science expert and, and they, it's very difficult for them to communicate and to, to act together as a team. Yeah? And I'm sure everybody who has experienced interdisciplinary teamwork, how much hours and days and months, sometimes years, you lose in just in communication because you talk about you talk about the same but in different languages. Yeah? There's someone nodding their head and I'm sure you have made the same experience. And, and in particular we have these, these eye-shaped people who know everything about their own discipline but nothing else. It's very difficult to integrate them into teams. Yeah? Therefore, our T-shape then, hope they maybe have a little, little bit less long vertical lag. So they, they, they know less about hydraulic engineering or about uh, uh, governance or whatever they study. But they have the horizontal bar. The idea is that the horizontal bar enables them to, to work better as a team, to communicate better with each other. Huh? So that the, these T's then at the top uh, enables them to, to have better efficient communication and a better, better team approach. Because it's more than only the disciplinary depth. And we, we feel that this is also needed for PhD studies. You can challenge me on that in the discussion. Um, I'm happy to expand on that. But let me come to the uh, conclusion. Well, there was, as my last example, I want to bring that I conclude. Uh, sometimes you have these papers which really kind of are uh, influence your thinking. So I was reading uh, this, I found this paper uh, a bit more than a year ago, and, uh, and it was about the collective intelligence factor for the performance of human groups. At the time, I was responsible for, for uh, um, restructuring our education. We are so busy with that, but I'm, I, I kind of I, I try to lead that process. And we are thinking about how do we educate our students to become most effective as, as professionals later. And uh, it's, it's not that I understand social science very well, or that, that I usually read, read science papers of, of uh, human intelligence, but this is an interesting paper. I tried to summarize that paper in one slide. Um, what they did in this paper, they studied uh, about 700 people, they, they uh, randomly group them into different groups, two to five persons. These are typical teams. Later, in a professional context, you have to work with, with small teams to work on something. Is it flood management or is it uh, land use practices in Ghana or, or whatever? Yeah? Usually, you have small teams to be effective. And the same you have at, at, at big industries often. Yeah? You at Ford or at, at, at a chemical industry, you also have small teams that have to work together. And if they don't work together and if they are just driven by their ego, then there's not most efficient. But uh, so what they did, they put these people artificially into these groups, then they put them on some exercises, they gave them some visual puzzles or some brainstorming exercises, uh, making collective judgments as a group, that's another uh, uh, test or exam that they gave them. Also negotiating over limited resources, yeah, not only financial resources, also for water resources you could argue. So I found these, these type of exercises they gave these groups are, are related to, to our field a lot. Also, they gave some, some design tasks, architectural design tasks, but, but also designing irrigation scheme, you could argue, is a design task and has some relation to uh, architectural design problems, maybe. So that's what they did, and then they analyzed the results, findings out. First, there is something like a general collective intelligence that they call the C factor, these psychologists. I, 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 I'm not, not good at that, I don't know exactly how, why, why that is worth a science paper, but they at least could demonstrate that typically significant that the group, so one plus one is more than two sometimes. Yeah? That the group together can perform better as a couple of individuals. Good. I, I, I was surprised that this is such a use, but I always assumed that. However, now interesting is what, what came further on. 
First, it's not strongly correlated with the maximum individual intelligence. So if you have one very well-trained, very smart person in your team, the overall team performance is not necessarily better. Yeah? So having one super individual is not necessarily reflecting that the team itself is more effective. Yeah? That's already interesting, I feel. So it's more how the group together worked. And But it is correlated with three other things. First, with the social sensitivity of group members. It's how much the group members are able to read the eyes, uh, the mind on the eyes. So how social sensitive the group members are, how much they can listen to each other, how much do they understand each other, and how much are they, they prepared also to, to, uh, to, to um, believe or at least accept uh, different uh, opinions on things. So, so the social intelligence is, is very sensitive to the group performance. So if, if, you're, if you're just very smart but socially incompetent, that, that's not good for teamwork. Then equality in speaking terms. So if the conversation is dominated by a few people, that's, that's not good. It must be really equal in terms of speaking terms. They really found out that uh, if the conversation is not dominated by a few people, even maybe very knowledgeable people, um, it, it's not positive related to the overall team success. So it's really about how the group together joined. And then finally, they also say it's proportional to the number of females in the group. Um, they, they argue, but, but I, I have a tendency to believe in that, that it's also mediated by social sensitivity. Ladies usually, or females in general, have a uh, better or stronger social sensitivity than men, on average. They're opposite. <laughs> but on average, at least, ladies seem to have a better social sensitivity and therefore bring in these binding links in teams. Yeah? So, completely male-only teams perform, even if the, 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 the rest is the same, less good than, than better mixed teams. The question is now, how are female teams only? And they didn't tell me in that way. <laughs> I, um, I don't know. Okay, this is also, I recently published that in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Hess, and the discussion is still open till, till another till uh, another week or two. So if you have comments on this, all this T-shape and so we publish in HESP, there's a special issue in education uh, where, where these ideas are published. Please comment on it. Um, uh, I hope not too tough for me, therefore inviting me. <laughs> but constructive good criticism is always uh, uh, wanted. Feel free to comment on this paper. Let me conclude my lecture. Uh, I hope I was able to explain that the world is changing for quite a number of reasons. So climate change is usually the first one that comes up, but it's many more changes that, that are uh, relevant. Predicting the hydrological impacts is, is very, very difficult. I try to illustrate that with this picture for biofuel impacts, yeah, how complex hydrological processes are, and how these simplified errors I was drawing on this, on this, uh, on this picture, how, how actually how they interact, yeah, and how many nonlinear processes are dominating their, their interactions. So it's the interaction between climate, water, land use, humans, policies, etc., etc. Also in the Chinese example, I try to stress the importance of uh, land use policies. I think in particular the Global South is uh, exposed to quite some challenges. Um, I feel capacity development education is, is one of the solutions to, to, uh, to, to be able to, to deal with it. It's one of the so-called no-regret measures. Finally, I, I hope I was able to make my point that, that I believe that systems thinking is, the, uh, is, is a useful concept to structure your education and uh, that uh, we believe that this T-shaped competency profile is a useful competency profile to, to aim for in our educational programs. Good. Thank you very much.